Iowa v. Kelsey Ray Thomas, case FECR 011664. The state is represented by Wapolo County Attorney Ruben Neff and Assistant Attorney General Marie Hughes, who are both personally present. The defendant is personally present with her attorneys, Alan Cook and Nicole Jensen. This case is set as a bench trial before the court on count one of the trial information previously filed August 1, 2018, as amended on February 7, 2020. The defendant previously had a jury trial in March of this year. The jury was unable to reach a verdict on count one of the amended trial information, which charges the defendant with murder in the first degree. The defendant was acquitted on count two. Jury trial was reset on count one. The defendant has now waived her right to a jury trial, both in writing and on the record. The court has accepted this waiver as knowing, voluntary, and intelligent. We will proceed with the bench trial. The court understands that the state may begin by stating some stipulations to which defense counsel will agree. With that, go ahead, Mr. Neff. Yes, Your Honor. The state, in discussions with defense counsel, have come to the following stipulations as to witnesses. The state and the defense will be stipulating to the admission of transcripts from the jury trial that took place in March of Kaladra Cookett, Brittany Johnson, Corey Benj, Scott Adams, Blake Loeffler, Tom McAndrew, Aaron Thomas, Jill Gardner, and Brian Cutler. As to evidence, in lieu of resubmitting a significant number of exhibits throughout the trial, the state and defense are agreeing that we'll be stipulating to those admitted exhibits that were admitted from the periods of March 3rd to March 9th, 2020, in the first trial of State v. Kelsey Thomas. And we'll be stipulating to all foundational aspects so that those pieces of each of those exhibits will come in, in conjunction with the previously mentioned stipulated transcripts. Further, there are three other areas of stipulation regarding evidence that was not submitted at the last trial. The first is an audio recording made on July 20th, 2018, capturing discussions between Brittany Johnson and Kelsey Thomas. The defense and state agree that this honorable court should disregard hearsay statements that are in that recording since this is not a jury trial. The recording itself has not had the usual, for lack of a better term, amendments, cutting of that audio. So it is essentially in its original form, and we just ask the court to focus instead on the discussions of Brittany Johnson directly with Ms. Thomas. As to another evidentiary stipulation, there is a video recording made on July 24th, 2018, of Aaron Thomas' interview by Investigator Scott Adams. Specifically, the time frame that is stipulated to for the court to review is from the time frame of 3.08 p.m. to 3.10 p.m. Concerning any hearsay statements about Chloe Chandler's behavior at daycare, which are mentioned during that time period, we are not asking for the court to consider that for the truth of the matter asserted, but instead to aid the court in understanding the dynamic in the Thomas household simply by providing extra context. Finally, the last stipulation is a Department of Criminal Investigations transcription of a law enforcement interview conducted of Kelsey Thomas on July 24th, 2018 and July 26th, 2018. Both parties stipulate that the transcription does contain one mistake, specifically on the July 26th interview at line 10.450, page 240, the transcripts notes a yeah when the correct transcription should have been a no. Other than that, we would be stipulating to those transcriptions. There are references that were handled in motion in limine at the last trial that were excluded from that that have not been excluded from this specific transcription. We just 
ask the court to exclude what it could, are considered hearsay statements and to exclude references to polygraph. Uh, does that conclude the state's proposed stipulation at this time? Yes, Your Honor. And response, Mr. Cook? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we have discussed those same stipulations with the state and we are in agreement. Uh, the court will accept the party's stipulation. Uh, none of the exhibits referred to are currently in evidence. I, I can't um, r receive them into evidence at this point because they're not uh, filed EDMS, or at least they're not filed in proper form. But I do understand the party's stipulation. Thank uh, you. As a housekeeping matter, if we may... Uh, proceed with testimony um, and obviously I will ask the court to ask the defense and I don't expect it to be an issue in terms of witnesses referencing the exhibits that are stipulated to I understand that they have not been officially submitted uh, but for the aim of not having a large break right now to have those submitted electronically I uh, just have to proceed with witnesses and any break we have, we will be submitting uh, said exhibits uh, as we are able to. I, I presume that the, that'll be finalized by the end of the day. <clears throat> Mr. Cook? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I think we can, I think the defense will go ahead and stipulate that any exhibits received are under the assumption that they will be properly filed and accepted by the court, again, through that same stipulation. Very good. Beyond that, uh, Your Honor, I, I presume since the next step would be to go into what we expect to be Dr. Cadillier's testimony via Zoom, uh, which admittedly we're reaching that point a little quicker than I expected. Uh, I, mean, I imagine we can go through the colloquy for that matter with the defense. Um, the court has been informed that um, Dr. Cadillier uh, is going to testify in this bench trial via Zoom. Uh, it's my understanding that there isn't anything in the Iowa court rules or in the Iowa court supervisory orders which authorizes a witness to appear by Zoom in a criminal trial. However, I have been informed that the parties agree that this is an appropriate way of proceeding. And so I just want to make sure that um, particularly now the defense counsel and the defendant um, acknowledge the def that the defendant is knowingly and voluntarily and intelligently waiving her right to have personal uh, testimony by witnesses, specifically Dr. Cavalier, in this bench trial. Mr. Cook. Thank you, Eric. So the Zoom is that audio video starting? Yes. Yeah, and we'll be connecting the HDMI cable um, to the judges since it'll be through her computer and then projecting. At least that's a hope. Uh, thank Back you, on Honor. the record, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. And um, so the record is clear. The state and the defense have had prior discussions about Dr. Cattleweer appearing. Uh, I just had a, a small question as to whether or not that would be uh, by a live video stream, and uh, the state indicated that it would. And uh, Based on uh, those dynamics, we have no objection to Dr. Cattleweer appearing via Zoom for her testimony in this case. <clears throat> All right. Um, and I think I, uh, I appreciate that statement, Mr. Cook, but I think I do need to ask the um, defendant directly, Ms. Thomas. Um, I assume you've had an adequate time to talk with your counsel about this witness appearing by Zoom, have you? Yes. Okay. And do you knowingly and voluntarily and intelligently waive your right to have this witness appear in person? Yes. Okay. Um, with that, the court would allow the testimony of um, Dr. Cavalier by Zoom um, off the record so we can kind of get this.
be calling Dr. Michelle Cattelier to the stand. Okay. Um, we're on the record. Uh, Dr. Cattelier, this is Judge Gammon. Can you hear me? Um, you're sort of distorted, but I can hear you. Okay, I'm going to be speaking just very briefly in order to swear you in. Would you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is true and correct? So help you God. I do. Um, the court reporter is taking everything down and she will interrupt if she can't hear. Um, but with that, go ahead, Mr. Knott. Thank you, Your Honor. Just briefly for purposes of the record, Doctor, could you introduce yourself and state your name? And doctor, how are you currently employed? <coughs> I'm an associate medical examiner for the state of Iowa. And your honor, if, if possible for brevity's sake, um, I know we have not specifically written it into the stipulation or discussed it this morning, but it occurs to me that, uh, and I can work this out with the defense, the portion to establish her as an expert from the last trial. We do have the transcription of that. Uh, I don't know if they'd be okay with stipulating to that just for purpose of the record, so we move on. We'll also stipulate your honor. And I will provide the exact uh, transcription points for your honor at the end of this. Uh, court accepts the uh, party's stipulation. Go ahead, Mr. Knapp. Dr. Cattelier, moving past uh, your qualifications, which have been stipulated to, as well as your education and, and prior employment history, in our previous discussions, there were certain aspects of neck anatomy that you had noted you wished to go through. Um, if you could just explain how the concepts of neck anatomy uh, play into a case such as this relating to hanging, strangulation, asphyxia? Well, there are various kinds of asphyxia, which is defined as um, an inability to receive or utilize oxygen in the body. And uh, two of the major ways that um, oxygen is uh, distributed is through the airway or through the um, arterial system and in particular the brain is exquisitely sensitive to oxygen and is required life so the net has structures that anatomically allow blood to get to the brain and allow air to get to the lungs. As far as asphyxia, I apologize, it seems like there was feedback. As far as asphyxia, what are the manners in which that can occur, at least in terms of category uh, and concerning a person? Well, there, there are various categories. Um, some people um, have different ways to describe asphyxia, but one of the simplest ways is to separate in, it into um, major categories of chemical asphyxia, suffocation, and strangulation. Chemical asphyxia would occur when um, there is some chemical that interrupts oxygen utilization, such as carbon monoxide poisoning. Cyanide will do that. Um, suffocation is, I like to think of it as involving the airway. So if the face is blocked such that air cannot get in, if someone um, chokes such as, such as um, a bolus of food gets stuck in the airway. Those would be uh, samples of suffocation, and each one may have its own name. For instance, when food gets stuck in the airway, we also call it choking. 
Strangulation is another category. Um, lay people and most forensic pathologists, I, myself included, typically refer to strangulation as being manual strangulation. That's what we think of <clears throat> when we uh, describe strangulation. And that would be when someone's hands are used as a weapon around someone's neck. However, strangulation is, in the broader sense, includes any disruption of the vasculature of the neck, um, to a lesser extent the airway, uh, but that can come into play particularly um, strong or, or intense strangulation. But most of the time we're talking about blood um, blockage, and that would include hanging, other kinds of lig ligature strangulation, um, and manual strangulation. And so any category there, um, from a, a bar across the neck to a choke hold to hanging, would all come in under that general category of strangulation. Again, even though um, we typically in conversation would refer to strangulation as more uh, relating to um, an individual putting a ligature or hands around someone's neck versus hanging when there is suspension in the way of the body causes the injury. So just for clarification, is it correct to say that Manual, ligature, and hanging are subcategories of strangulation, which itself is a subcategory of asphyxia? Yes. And again, uh, different authors, different pathologists may like to categorize uh, asphyxia differently, but this is one common one. And as far as conducting an autopsy, looking for injury, how does force come into play in your work? Well, injury is caused by a force that displaces tissue in the body. So um, even when you have scratch of the skin, there is a force that puts tension on the skin such that the surface is interrupted. So force uh, that displaces tissue in the body causes injury if it is significant enough. It doesn't always. You can take your pulse and not injure yourself, but uh, with decreased surface area of the object causing force, with increased speed, with increased um, velocity, with increased mass, all of those factors um, can contribute to injury. Now we discussed strangulation. What is, at least in the context of strangulation, a primarily vascular compression? Significantly. In fact, 
someone who has um, a tracheostomy where there is no um, exchange of air above the neck can still be strangled and that air passage would be below the level of injury. As far as what is jugular comp compression? I'm sorry, was there a question? Dr. Cadillier, what is jugular compression? Oh, okay. Uh, well, the jugular veins are the major veins in the neck. There are many smaller branches, but the jugular are about um, there are two, the internal and the external, and they are up to about the diameter of your little finger. So they're fairly large veins, and they are responsible for the blood in the um, brain going back toward the heart. Because they're relatively superficial and relatively large, they are easy to compress. Um, because they're relatively close to the surface, doctors utilize that in order to um, put in a, an intravenous catheter in someone who's either going to need one long term or need one emergently because it's easy to reach. So sometimes we see um, no, uh, could you catheters in the neck um, over the area of the jugular vein. Uh, Dr. Cadillier, seems that the last portion of your statements were not caught by the microphone. Um, well, could you repeat that by any chance? Um, do can you read back what was the last thing I said, please? Um, because they're relatively close to the surface, doctors utilize that in order to put an intravenous catheter in someone who is either going to need one long term or need one emergently. Well, I, I couldn't hear that, so I'll just go ahead and start over if that's all right. Uh, the court reporter is simply noting the portion where you were describing how the jugular due to its size is typically used by doctors to insert uh, intravenous uh, ten, it's, and, and, it, it's large and it is also relatively near the surface so it's easy to access and is often used medically because of that um, it is also easy to compress so uh, if there is a force around the neck from a ligature or hands or an object, um, it's easy to compress the jugulars. In fact, it only takes about four pounds of pressure to do that, um, maybe up to six pounds. So uh, when that occurs, the blood begins to back up in the head and the face and neck above that area become what we call plethoric, which means purple and flush. Sometimes there's even swelling. And the other thing that happens oftentimes is that there are petechiae. And petechiae are tiny pinpoint hemorrhages. They're one of the hallmarks of asphyxia. They're not specific. But when we see them, we think of the possibility of asphyxia because that compression of the venous system causes blood to back up and then uh, leak out of tiny little capillaries at the uh, area of interchange between the arterial system and the venous system. So anything that causes um, increased pressure in the right heart, which uh, pumps the venous system from heart failure um, and back up that way to a mechanical pressure such as with uh, compression of the jugular veins can cause petechia. Now, if you could, what is parotid uh, compression and how does that play out when it comes to petechiae? Carotid compression refers to the carotid arteries. Those are the major arteries that supply the brain. Um, there are other arteries that supply the brain, but they are 
much smaller and less significant anatomically. The carotid arteries are on both sides of the neck, near where the jugular veins are, but they're more protected. The arterial system um, would be considered physiologically perhaps more important because the blood has to get out from the heart to the rest of the body through that system um, before it can even come back through the venous system. So they are protected um, and they rest uh, right against the uh, vertebral column or spine, which is toward the back of the neck. So um, they are on either side of the neck. And that bone there, the vertebral column, is a, a static surface um, that will serve to allow compression to occur because when you press on the carotids on one side, there, it's pushed against the bone on the other side, and that can obstruct arterial um, blood traveling through it to get to the brain and facial structures. In a carotid compression situation, what would you expect as far as petechiae? If the carotids are completely um, compressed, and in particular, if other vessels as well are completely compressed, you will not see any petechiae because it is the back of the blood that causes petechiae. That means that um, with the carotids completely compressed, the uh, venous system will also be compressed, and so there's no leakage um, at, between those two. As far as strangulation, what type of, is, is the pressure consistent during a manual or ligature strangulation? In other words, carried out by another? Well, it depends. If the um, perpetrator, the person who is doing the strangulation, is cons considerably um, stronger than the victim, or if the victim is compromised in some way, such as under the influence of drugs, or asleep, or if that person is very small compared to the person who is um, doing the compression, or if there's an object such that um, the object's weight is uniform, then um, the pressure would be steady. Under cases of manual strangulation and some ligature strangulation, if the um, people are um, of sound body and strength enough to struggle, then usually a struggle takes place. Um, and that struggle can result in movement. Movement can result in friction. Also, um, with strangulation, with compression of the arterial system, it only takes between three and 10 seconds of pressure before loss of consciousness takes place. After loss of consciousness takes place, it's not unusual for someone to, for the perpetrator to let go. But then if um, a short enough time has gone by, the person will wake up again and begin to move and uh, potentially struggle again. So that change in movement, change in course direction and um, reaction to movement one to the other can result in um, an unsteady compression sequence. In comparing hangings as a form of strangulation to a manual or 
ligature strangulation. Uh, what do you tend to see as far as the intermittentness or consistency of the force? Well, with a hanging, a typical ligature hanging, you the um, ligature is compressed against the neck with the assistance of the weight of the head and or the body. And so that suspension is maintained and the compression is afforded by that weight um, that is against the ligature. Um, some Again, hangings can be very depending upon the type of ligature, the weight of the victim, the length of the suspension, etc. It's not unusual for a hanging to have um, a hanging victim to have the TPI, um, and that's because sometimes the ligature is not um, compressed against the neck with a really strong force, uh, such as with a partial suspension. In other words, a person can be hanged and still have their feet or their knees on the ground. They can just lean into the ligature. But the less um, significant the weight against the ligature, the more likely that those veins will be, at least for a time, partially compressed. We see this when people test the ligature before letting themselves completely hang. Or when um, the ligature, when the um, person is of light weight or the angle is such that uh, the compression is um, partial. In a typical suspension hang, however, the ligature is relatively uniformly applied around the neck, and that weight of the body um, and the weight of the head can cause loss of consciousness, again, within three to 10 seconds. And so because of that uniformity of the ligature suspending the body at the neck, um, that loss of consciousness, once it occurs, results in the head robbing and that weight being applied relatively uniform. And so the vessels then are uniformly compressed and that means that it's very unlikely to see the TPI or many TPI because of that um, compression that includes the arterial system, the carotid arteries, as well as the venous And just to clarify, when you say suspension, you're describing a hanging where the person's feet are essentially dangling. They're not catching on any chair or floor or anything like that, correct? No, actually that's not correct. Suspension simply means that the ligature is used to, to encircle the neck or partially encircle the neck and the weight of the body is causing the, um, effectively the injury or the compression. There can be complete suspension, which is what you described when the feet are off the ground and the weight is completely um, uh, under the ligature or supported by the ligature. But as I said before, many um, hangings can occur with partial suspension. They're probably more common than complete suspension when we talk about things like suicidal pain. Um, so a person can hang themselves against a bed post by just putting a ligature against the post and leaning against the, having the neck lean against that ligature. Or they can suspend a dog leash over a doorknob and kneel down and simply um, lean into the ligature. That's a partial suspension. And again, partial suspensions tend to have more petechiae, although they don't always. Uh, certainly, um, any kind of hanging death is, in general, um, associated with um, 
keyword or no ETF. So about maybe 20, 25% of hangings will have the TPI, but many of them do not. As far as your understanding through your experience and training, what is the relationship between injury and the response of the individual that is uh, asphyxiating? Can you ask that in a different way, please? Yes. Uh, what do you, as medical examiners, know of the relationship between injury and the response during an asphyxia? Well, if I understand the question correctly, um, it is normal to um, resist the uh, application of force around the neck. Even people who hang themselves sui in suicide, who intend to die, um, can have a reflexive uh, movement of the hand to the uh, ligature to try to relieve that pressure. Certainly, if it is an unwilling victim, um, that uh, reflex, if you will, is, is more conscious and um, a person can attempt to remove that ligature um, with hands. Did, did that answer your question? Yes, uh, I'll ask some more specifics, though. What effects what are the first effects of asphyxia on, say, the eyes of an individual that's asphyxiating? Oh, um, well, we can't do experiments on people. However, uh, much of what we know about the response of the body to hanging in particular um, is the result of observations of victims or their description of uh, what happens during that process. Are there in any? 19, in 1940, Rossen, R O S S E N, um, and uh, conducted a number of studies whereupon he used uh, patients in a hospital and volunteers to put a ligature around their neck, I believe they use something that's similar to a blood pressure cuff, and pump that up to the point that those people lost consciousness. And then he would observe their activity and uh, remove the constriction prior to them hopefully having brain damage. One of the first things that was observed to happen was what they call fixation of the eyes. The eyes would uh, stop moving from side to side, stop uh, looking around the room. They were just fixed in place. And uh, that had uh, a quality you might think of as a staring because the eyes couldn't move. The person who was being um, strangled, if you will, reported that they were still conscious at that point, and they couldn't move their eyes. They knew they couldn't move them, they could still see, but um, the eyes uh, could not be moved. And that was followed very rapidly by loss of consciousness. In the literature, or in your field, has there been any corroboration of this 1940s study? Um, I don't believe so. Um, again, we can't really do experiments. Um, however, in this digital age, we do have a number of um, predominantly suicide victims who chose to um, video the process of their dying. And so um, the sequence of events that usually occurs with, with the body as it um, goes through stages uh, from initial compression of the neck to death have been video. Um, I don't think that, I have not heard 
for our test recall, whether the eyes in particular were discussed, usually those figures have at least emphasized larger um, body movements that were more uh, readily recognized. If they talked about the eyes, I do not. Has there been any literature that disproves proves, uh, Rosen's findings in his 1940 studies? Not that I'm aware of, no. As far as loss of consciousness and convulsions, uh, could you walk us through the time frame and process where convulsions come into play during asphyxia? Yes. Um, the studies that I refer to, um, most of them were authored by a woman named Sauvageau, uh, uh, French name. Um, report that, um, again, within about three to 10 seconds, typically, consciousness is lost after suspension by the neck. Um, that, and then I mean complete suspension. Again, it can take a lot longer if the compression is intermittent. But with complete compression, about three to 10 seconds to lose consciousness. After that, uh, there is usually a seizure activity, which is um, what's referred to as tonic-clonic seizures, which is what we think of uh, when there are various kinds of seizures. But when we think of seizures, we think of shaking. And that is typically what um, begins the sequence of uh, injury to the brain. Then there's what's called a desteric posturing, and um, that is where the uh, arms are in flexion, the wrists are in flexion, and I'm demonstrating that here. It's a kind of um, fisted uh, movement where the uh, hands are uh, in tightness and the um, elbows are uh, uh, flexed toward so that the hands are toward the chest. After that, there's what's called um, decorticate posturing. And again, posturing refers to movement of muscles that occur reflexly when the um, cerebral cortex part of the brain that does the thinking and directing of our movements. When the blood is um, compromised there and the cortex begins to be injured, then lower levels of the brain stem, or the brain, take over and the movement is more reflexive. Um, we see evidence of this when people have strokes. Sometimes part of the brain is injured and the other part, and the part that supplies um, movement of the arms and legs, for instance, uh, when it's interrupted, can result in some that type of posturing where the muscles are no longer properly controlled by the higher levels of the brain. So the lower levels of brainstem begins to take over. And the next posturing after the decerebrate is called decorticate, and that's when um, it's similar, but the arms still being somewhat fisted, uh, stretch outward as though they were reaching for the knees or reaching um, across the room with uh, the elbows straightened out. These are reflexive movements, and um, so they typically occur over a period of about all of them over a period of about, I would say about three to six minutes. Um, it, um, it varies, each stage varies somewhat. But with that loss of uh, blood to the brain, that sequence occurs with, um, according to Rawson, um, fixation of the eyes, um, loss of consciousness, seizure activity, um, the cerebral posturing, the cortical posturing, 
independent, there uh, can be um, a relaxation or a flaccidity, we call it. The body becomes flaccid or no longer with tense muscles um, as a further uh, damage to the brain occurs. There can be um, changes in respiration. Respiration will first uh, be deeper and then more shallow. Um, and uh, there can be uh, a few muscle twitches after that before the body becomes completely silent. Now, in a situation of a complete suspension hanging, I presume. Uh, there's still going to be twitching and muscle spasming, correct? In most cases, yes. There have been um, reports of observed pains without that. And interestingly, um, there have been theories as to why that occurs. And if you'd like, I can go into that. But um, most pains would be expected to have some kind of seizure activity and posturing. Uh, prior to death. And those seizures, even if violent, do they affect the ligature mark that is typically found in a hanging? Well, most hangings result in very little injury. Um, so the uh, ligature tends to be in one spot, although it can slip. Certainly, if a person puts a ligature like below the level of the Adam's apple, it will tighten it at that location. And then with suspension, um, as the weight of the body takes over, sometimes the ligature will slip up to a higher uh, location. So those kinds of uh, movements uh, can occur. And I think that's when we see a lot of uh, the injury that occurs with hanging. Although injury is less frequent and less in amount with hanging than with other kinds of strangulation, in particular manual strangulation or ligature strangulation by another, um, the hanging injury tends to be uh, very little. So um, that tells us that despite the fact that the body has um, a lot of uh, movement in the way of reflexive and seizure-like activity that oftentimes uh, the ligature remains steady and injury does not occur in the neck um, as a consequence. Now you mentioned some examples of times where that spasming did not occur. Um, what instances in the literature that you're familiar with or in your own work experience that you're familiar with where that spasming did not occur? Well, I personally have don't recall having seen a video sequence other than in uh, in meetings. I've seen other video sequences that have been um, published, but um, the one case that I can think of, I believe it was also Sabajo, um, described a person who had um, painted himself and used some kind of device uh, that was uh, suspended above him, uh, I presume from the ceiling, and it was sort of like an eye hook or some device that was allowed, that allowed for rotation. And the body was observed to immediately begin to rotate through that suspension, through the ligature and the rope, um, and twist around in circles. And there was no um, reflexive decerebrate corticate posturing observed. The authors theorized that this was because of the movement in circles that the body had um, sustained. The system in our body that uh, reacts to and um, allows us to manage movement is called the vestibular system. It's in the inner ear. And um, when we turn to the thigh, it helps us to coordinate our vision, our ability to see the environment and recognize when we're upright. Um, it allows us to know when we're turning. 
and it's what contributes to us feeling dizzy when we spin. That vestibular system has connections, neuronal connections or connections of nerves that are uh, primarily at uh, subconscious levels like the brain stem. There are some additional connections to the higher brain that allow us to um, know what's going on. But that, but many of the reflexes that we have that allow us to, for instance, um, shoot our arm out when we're going to fall, um, those uh, reflex, reflex connections, the neuronal connection um, of the vertebral system are at the brainstem level. So it was theorized that with this person who was spinning, that that vertebral system kind of overrode the other reflexes such that the uh, posturing did not occur. Uh, that was a theory, a hypothesis. I don't think that that's been proven, but um, that does make sense. So essentially, the spasming you would expect in a hanging, uh, in that situation, it's possible that the inner ear system um, overrode that typical response. That's, what's, that's what was proposed as a mechanism. Again, the, the brain is complicated, and every situation has its own variables. So um, again, I don't think that experiments have proven that hypothesis, but uh, again, it's um, of interest because it does make anatomic sense. When you review hangings and conduct your autopsies, do you come in with the assumption that that body, that uh, hung individual, was static or not moving during the hanging? I don't make assumptions at all. Sometimes I like I will um, make hypotheses that uh, would be correlated with the scene investigation. For instance, if I see the TPI, I might want to um, find out if the body was partially suspended, which would uh, let it lend credence to how that occurred. But I don't. I'm not sure I, I answered your question, but I don't know that I have assumptions. Based on your training and experience and the literature you're familiar with, would you expect a victim of a hanging to have hung in some static manner, or would you expect movement? Well, again, it depends upon the circumstances. First, I would expect there to be some movement as a result of seizure activity, um, but it would, again, be varied from person to person. But the seizure activity plus the decorticate and the cerebral posturing would usually result in movement. What are your typical findings in conducting an autopsy in a strangulation? Um, if one were to just describe a strangulation, a manual strangulation, in other words, a person taking hands to the neck of another, the typical findings that we would look for uh, would be petechiae. The petechiae are most often seen um, on the surfaces of the eye and eyelid, um, around the eye and on the face, and in some cases, um, seems like also in children, those petechiae will go even onto the side of the face or the scalp. Uh, sometimes uh, they're limited to the eyes or the periorbital region. But that, that's something, it doesn't be, petechiae don't have to be there, and again, they're non-specific, but they are a hallmark of strangulation. We look for um, injury of the neck. Uh, with manual strangulation, those might be bruises. They, the bruises might uh, take the shape of finger pads. Uh, they might um, be elongated uh, because of uh, the hand wrapping the neck. 
Um, we sometimes see fingernail marks, little curved um, abrasions um, or straight little flat abrasions due to either the perpetrator or the victim's fingers having scratched the skin. Uh, so bruises and abrasions are common. Internally, uh, we look for hemorrhage of the neck. Um, there are strap muscles. Those are the muscles that are in the front of the neck that allow for uh, not only some uh, movement of the head upon the neck, but also um, speaking and so forth. Those muscles in the front of the neck um, often have injury. And the injury can be very subtle. Um, even with a violent strangulation, there's not always physical injury. Uh, but we look for it, and we look for it carefully because it can be subtle in small amounts or unevenly distributed. So we look for hemorrhage in those strap muscles. Uh, we look for hemorrhage surrounding the um, hard structures of the neck. One structure of the neck that's hard is the thyroid cartilage. That's what causes, that's what is, um, let me say that again. The center of the thyroid cartilage is the Adam's apple. It's a shield-shaped cartilage, and it has little um, pointy ends on the sides. Of, we call them cornua, or uh, that means horns. So those little pointy ends can be broken off. That is a sign of injury of the neck, and sometimes the hemorrhage. If that, that happens during life, then there's hemorrhage there. Even just a tiny bit, even just a few drops of blood there. Sometimes there's quite a bit of blood around those um, bony structures. Uh, well, that's actually cartilaginous structure. Um, above the thyroid cartilage, above the Adam's apple, just at the uh, base of the tongue, at the top of the neck, is a horseshoe-shaped bone called the hyoid bone. That bone can also be fractured, and there would be uh, potentially hemorrhage of the hyoid bone. Sometimes other structures high in the neck, like salivary glands, can have some hemorrhage. Um, one thing we look for um, is hemorrhage around the carotid arteries, because if there has been friction over those vessels, causing them to be compressed and injured, then those vessels themselves can have hemorrhage. So we look for hemorrhage around the carotid arteries. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, with manual strangulation in particular, we will see hemorrhage around the carotids, whereas um, with hanging, even when there's hemorrhage in the neck, it's less common. Um, we also look for petechiae inside. You can have petechiae inside the, the gums of the mouth. You can have them overlying the slippery surface of the lungs. Um, you can have them uh, sometimes um, less uh, specifically in the head. We also look into the muscles that are within the vocal cords. Um, those can have hemorrhages that we can see with our eyes, oftentimes in strangulation. So all of these things can occur. Sometimes even more forceful injury will cause uh, <coughs> the uh, vertebra of the neck to break. Um, that can happen with a particularly forceful um, strangulation. Uh, sometimes there can be uh, injury at the back of the neck, again, with either a posterior component of force being applied or particularly uh, significant force being applied. As far as children and injury, uh, how are children, how do they display these injuries differently than adults typically? Well, children are not uh, miniature adults. They have um, 
they are still growing. They have a different um, composition to some extent than adults do. One way that they're different is that um, in order to allow growth, um, much of the bone which begins as cartilage is still cartilage in children. Uh, there are what we call growth plates, which are in the long bones like um, the humerus or the femur. And those bones, uh, in order to grow, uh, have what we call plates of cartilage uh, through which the bone can grow. Um, and so they have more cartilage in the bone. Um, a young person has that thyroid cartilage that is completely made of cartilage. Um, once a person gets to be 30, 40 years old, uh, that can begin to change into a partial or complete bone. So that by the time a person is about 60, 70, 80 years old, um, that whole thyroid cartilage, even though we call it cartilage, is actually um, taken over by bone. So the body of an adult is more brittle, and in addition to having more cartilage, the bone itself is more elastic. So a child, for instance, who breaks a bone in the arm, sometimes will have a typical break where the bone snaps in two. But they can also have what's called a green stick cartilage, and, or green, green stick fracture, and that's where the bone is bent and only one side of the bone will, crack, uh, will break. It's like if you take a piece of wood that is still green and you bend it and try to break it. Sometimes that um, green uh, wood will not break or will break only on one side because it's more elastic. A child's bone tends to be more elastic, so bones don't break as readily. I can see, um, and, and that goes into um, sometimes uh, young adulthood. Uh, when I see a motor vehicle accident um, of, say, a driver and the uh, dashboard is, or the airbag is pushed into the chest, if that driver is in their 20s or teens, I might not see any fractures at all of the ribs. And yet, there can be tearing of the aorta or holes in the heart because of the forces that compress the soft tissue underneath that the ribs won't break. If I see that same injury in someone who's 60 years old, they might have many rib fractures and uh, usually do, in addition to the uh, compressive injuries of the chest. So children are more elastic. In addition, the skin, the soft tissues are more resilient. We see this in our own cells if we age, where the skin is thinner, um, it's e more easily displaced, it's less, um, it, it's less elastic than with the child. And so oftentimes, and in particular, with strangulation injuries, um, children tend to have fewer injuries. Sometimes injuries occur, um, but they tend to be fewer in quantity and um, less significant for the type of force applied compared with the same kind of injury in an adult. Now. I know we've discussed uh, through reference literature relating to what you're discussing now. You took part in a study in 1985, uh, I believe, or at least are familiar with the Indianapolis study uh, by Clark. Uh, could you walk us through what that was and how that informs your opinion? Well, um, although hanging in particular in children are 
rare. They're um, a small proportion of cases that occur. And any asphyxial death in children, whether it's pain or another kind of asphyxia, um, not only are they tragic, but because they occur less frequently, sometimes they are reported often as case studies because um, of their relative infrequency. Mike Clark um, was one of my mentors. Um, I grew up in Indianapolis, and I went to Indiana University Medical School. And um, when I became interested in forensic pathology, I spent time in the coroner's office in uh, Marion County. And so I was doing autopsies and, and observing autopsies and learning from Mike Clark and some of his colleagues, John Pless and so forth. And they wrote uh, this paper where they had collected um, 12 cases of children under the age of 13 that had sustained pain injuries. And they reported on each one. Um, I didn't exactly take part in um, the uh, paper. Um, I may have done one of the autopsies, but I'm not sure. I can't remember. But I do remember um, when they would give lectures to me or individual um, talks, they showed me some of the cases. And one case in particular that they reported was of a little one who was riding a tricycle, and it was motor, or a similar device to a tricycle. I can't remember exactly what the uh, toy was. But it had been motorized, and the child ran it into some kind of a, a barrier, like a rope strung across the room, or, or some kind of a barrier that caught him at the neck. And um, the child couldn't maneuver the um, vehicle well enough to extricate himself, and so he was hanged. There were a number of other studies for other cases, um, including um, children who had uh, hanged themselves with a noose, um, one on a monkey bar who had hanged himself, um, one child had a bicycle chain around his neck and hanged himself from a bunk bed. And in their study of those, um, only three had internal injuries of the neck at all. Um, one of the children uh, had hanged himself outside of a barn. Uh, I can't recall if it was uh, an experimenting play or if he was suicidal, but he was only, I believe, 11 years old. Um, yes, 11 years old, and they described that the wall of the barn had marks consistent with him kicking that barn, either in order to try to extricate himself from um, the situation or in the final throes of his seizure activity. But despite that movement, he had no internal neck injuries. So of their um, cases, only three had any injury at all, and most of them did not. And this is um, something that we see over and over in the literature, is that occasionally children have injury. Usually it's described as one muscle or one side with a, a couple little hemorrhages, um, but they tend to have very little in the way of injury, especially compared with an adult. Again, in hangings, we often don't see injury in the neck at all. When I have medical students at my elbow in an autopsy, I will often ask them in a hanging case, what do you expect to see in the neck? And they'll say, well, bruises, maybe, maybe fractures. A good part of the time, we see nothing. Um, and uh, that can be a surprise because when we think of an injury that's significant enough to cause death, we think that there should be a visual sign of that, but that certainly is not the case. 
weeks, and in Haynes, it's uh, more frequent than not that there is no need. Now, as far as autopsies you have conducted since being here in Iowa, are there any ex uh, examples that you could use to illustrate uh, the findings you've just described in the literature of there being rarely any internal hemorrhaging or injury for a child who is asphyxiated? Yes. Um, one tragic case that I can think of, I believe I can use their names because they've already been adjudicated, um, were the Sumi girls who uh, lived in um, northwestern Iowa. And uh, they were victims of uh, their, I believe he was a stepfather's um, activity that included some um, witchcraft kind of um, uh, motive that he had. And he had injured them a bit. Um, in the course of his um, ritual, but the majority of, or the major findings that they were dead. And um, one of them, the younger one, who was about eight or nine years old, had a ligature around her neck, and it was um, a belt that was made of a of a strapping material, of a cloth woven belt, and it had a D-ring fastener or a metal fastener of a buckle. And uh, that ligature was around her neck when she came to autopsy. The ligature was tightened such that when it was cinched tight around her neck, it pinched the skin hard enough to lacerate the skin. In other words, tear the skin on the outside. And she had a ligature furrow of her neck. She also had a fractured neck. In the back of her um, neck, one of the cervical vertebrae had been broken. So there was considerable force in the strangulation of her. There was no injury in the neck in terms of visible hemorrhage of the strap muscles, fractures of the fiery cartilage, fractures of the hyoid bone, blood around the carotid arteries, blood in the vocalis muscles. None of that was there. She did have the TPI, and that was um, all except that extra. Her sister, who was a couple years older than her, had no visible um, or no uh, diagnostic injury of the outside of the neck or the inside of the neck. She was found with um, a lady slip, underwear slip, next to her. And it was thought that that was likely used as a ligature. Um, she had Petechia, she had no injury externally or internally at all. Um, I was comfortable that she was um, strangled because of the uh, presence of that slip and the, the manner in which her sister had died. They were both found together in the same room. So those are two examples of violent strangulation deaths where uh, the children showed no injury of the strap muscles or other structures of the anterior and middle neck. Did you want me to give any other examples? Are there any more recent studies that you rely on that have followed up on this 1985 study you were referencing earlier? Well, yes, through the years, uh, there have been quite a lot of um, just case reports and reports of hangings. There have been a couple that have come out of India. Interestingly, um, uh, one is by the authors Jacques Rapash 
Jaya Prakash and Shukumari. Um, that was in, uh, I believe, 2012. And there was another one by Patel and uh, colleagues. I, I can check on the date if you like. But both of those had um, a number of hanging deaths, uh, adults and children. And um, the uh, Jaya Prakash uh, had uh, a total of 189 cases of pain. And the people were 11 to 90 years of age. Um, of those, 78.3% or 148 ca cases had no internal neck injury. Um, Patel had similar findings. Um, and I find it interesting that um, in India, in the cases that they uh, report, uh, most of the hangings were uh, using a cloth ligature. There was uh, a lot of cloth available because of um, the clothing that, that the people wear there, the saris and um, the scarves that go with the saris. And so many of the people that they described um, were hanged using a cloth ligature. And they had very few, um, a very small percentage of cases with internal neck injury. Now, going to the autopsy you conducted in this case, uh, do you recall carrying out an autopsy of Chloe Chandler? Yes. When she arrived for purposes of your autopsy, what do you recall the history being that was reported to you? Um, the history was that she had hanged herself um, it was presumed in play in the closet of her bed. Now, is there... And, and that the, um, that she was thought, well, she was hanged by, um, a pair of pajama pants. Now, is there any difference of procedure in dealing with organ donation, uh, when it's considered a suicide or when it's considered suspicious, as in foul play is involved? Iowa donor network, and um, we as medical examiners work closely with them, and we try to allow for uh, tissue donation in as many cases as possible. If a person is a homicide victim, it will depend upon the history and the uh, circumstances whether we will um, authorize Iowa donor network to take tissue and what kind of tissue we will authorize. Post-mortem tissue donation can include the heart valves, um, long bones, um, some of the soft tissues such as veins and tendons in, in the limbs and the eyes. Um, and so, and also the skin, the skin of the back um, is often donated. So we will uh, review the history of the case in order to determine whether there's any reason to restrict tissue donation. Um, if someone has a gunshot wound to the head and they were uh, described as being in a vehicle and someone came up to the vehicle and shot them, there's no reason to think that they were involved in a physical altercation. Um, the um, cause of death is not likely to be um, disputed, um, but assuming that we do a thorough autopsy. And so we will oftentimes, um, with appropriate history, authorize that kind of case for some tissue donation. If a case is potentially involving an altercation with another person, or if the circumstances are unusual, um, then we will probably not authorize all 
or much tissue donation. One example I can give you is a case from this week when I was on call. A child was found dead and um, it was uncertain what happened. Um, so I, I won't give you details of that because of privacy issues, but um, I did not authorize um, tissue donation because it was unusual. It could have been a hanging, it could have been an electrocution, it could have been some other things. So I did not authorize that because we want the body to be complete and have as much, the body is our evidence, we want to have as much available there as we need to make a proper diagnosis. So it depends upon the case. We try to allow tissue donation, but if it is going to be one that would be confusing or contested or unusual um, or involving an altercation, then typically we don't allow that donation to take place. In this case, was it authorized to uh, donate any of Chloe Chandler's uh, organs or tissues? Yes. Yes, her heart and her knee joints were donated. And at least at the time of that authorization, uh, why was that? Well, I can't remember if I was the pathologist who was um, consulted on that or if it was another pathologist. But um, with the history of an accidental hanging um, and uh, no report to us of concerns at the time that this was anything other than a tragic event, um, the tissue donation was authorized. Now going to the autopsy itself, um, could you walk us through your findings of Chloe Chandler? And I do believe uh, you have a digital set of slides. Um, if you need to rely on any state exhibit uh, that was previously numbered uh, that we will attend to later, uh, just project the slide to your screen and then reference it as to the number that it, it relates to, it, if that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Neff, before we get started on what sounds like it could be uh, fairly lengthy and involved, I think we'll go ahead and take a morning break. Uh, and resume uh, at uh, 10 and 11 by that clock on the wall. Yes, Your Honor. And Dr. Cadillier, uh, if we could yes, just... I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I, I heard Frank, but I don't know how long. And if we're off the record... Uh... We're off the record.